yeah. I get emails, like I said, from around the world um, and asking for help. And one of the biggest issues is doctors saying, you know, pull the plug, there's no chance of survival or any kind of meaningful recovery. So just let them go and pull, you know, let them die. Uh, but no, we can't give them fish oil because that might hurt them. Exactly. What? what? I what? just, I, I don't. <laughs> the disconnect there doesn't ever make any sense. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome into Pushing the Limits. Your host, Lisa Tamati, here, and I am super excited. I have uh, Colonel and Dr. Michael Lewis to guest. Thank you so much for coming on, Dr. Lewis. It's really fabulous to have you. Oh, it's my pleasure, Lisa. I'm great. You know, anything for my friends in New Zealand. <laughs> have you got some friends down here? Do you know anybody well, down you know, in New Zealand? Actually, when I went to university, uh, it was a requirement that the British... Uh, exchange officer had to be a rugby coach and we were fortunate to have a, a, a an officer who had transferred from the New Zealand SAS to the British SAS and then second Paris and uh, he, uh, he's either in London right now or on his farm down there outside of Wellington so, uh, <laughs> that was my introduction to New Zealanders uh, was literally through rugby Oh, brilliant. Well, that is our national sport, so to speak. We're world famous for our All Blacks and uh, our, our ladies who play as well. And we have some, yeah, we've got a, a big history there. So, yeah, that's that. well, that's a nice connection. Um, well, Dr. Lewis, um, could you give us a bit of a brief background? Because today we're going to be diving into fish oil. But literally, we're going to be diving into fish oil and brain health. And uh, But before we go there, can you just give us a little bit of your amazing and incredible background? background before we get started well like i said i at university so i went to the u.s military academy at west point and uh you know the, its principal purpose is to develop our officers for the army and went out and i say played army for a few years and then decided to go to medical school and uh after some surgical training and then general practice for a little while and then got uh international infectious disease work kind of all over the place, uh, stationed in Southeast Asia for a while. And then by then, uh, Af Iraq and Afghanistan were going on back to, uh, I was brought back to the medical school, military medical school in Bethesda, Maryland, across the street from the NIH. Mm -hmm. And now we got, um, you know, wounded warriors everywhere. And I kind of put two and two together, came up with an odd number and, and said, and went to the head of research, said, is anybody looking at the use of omega-3s like you would get from fish oil uh, to help our soldiers recover from traumatic brain injury? And he thought about it and didn't just blow me off like most doctors do. Yeah, yeah. Thought about it and he said, no, nobody's looking at that. Why don't you? And um, and so that was a career change. That was uh, eighteen years ago, almost eighteen years ago. And wow. I've been on that trek ever since. Wow, wow! And to go from infectious diseases and being out in the in the wilderness and you know doing all those hard yards to come back, and you know we have. You, you, in America, obviously, you have so many veterans who are coming back with brain injuries of of many types, um, and so this is a very you know uh, hot topic, really. I, uh, I should imagine over there, um, and we we have many brain injuries across, of course, all our sports, and you know rugby being one of those things, which is a great sport, but does uh, increase our risk. I've got a, a brother who is an ex-professional rugby player and certainly is dealing with the aftermath of repeated concussions um, throughout his career. Uh, and, and of course, the soldiers who are exposed to blast trauma and, and you know, lots of, lots of really difficult things. Um, it's really imperative that we, you know, find ways. And, you know, like the, you, if you have a concussion now and you go to present to ED, they may do a CT scan. And if it's not like you're dying immediately, it's basically go home and rest, right? That's like go into a dark room for two weeks, you know? <laughs> oh, my uh, my computer slid down on me there. So <laughs> it's all good. Um, but um, yeah, no, you actually bring up a really good point is that uh, in the emergency room, you go to the emergency department. And they may or may not do a, a CT scan. I, I think they're generally way overdone. 
Uh, but a CT scan is essentially a surgical tool. It's is somebody bleeding and do we have to rush them to the operating room for emergency surgery? And so that's really the main use for it. It doesn't tell you outside of if there's a brain bleed, it doesn't tell you if there's an actual concussion. It's uh, probably a misunderstood concept about uh, about concussions. You're never going to see a, say, a typical sport related concussion, even if somebody was unconscious, which is very rare, actually, but um, even if they're knocked unconscious, really extremely rare that there's a brain bleed uh, that, that requires emergency surgery. Yeah. And so this is, and, and, and you know, our recommendations haven't really changed in a thousand years, you know, like going to sit in a dark room and, and <laughs> have some rest and you'll be right in a couple of weeks, you know, and that, that paradigm, funny. it's not true. Yeah. No, it's not. It's, it's funny because uh, I, I'm, I'm laughing because I was with a colleague from university of London. We were at a, at a very, a little invitation only uh, of thing to look at the concept of fish oil and brain injury. And I, I said to her over a beer at the pub that, that night, I said, it's it's frustrating we're not doing anything different than we did 500 years ago. And she goes, well, that's not true at all. It's been at least a thousand years. So <laughs> yeah. I laughed that you said that. <laughs> exactly. It's a thousand years of telling us the same things. And, and that's despite all the incredible advances we've made in medicine, um, that we're not doing anything proactive. We're also not doing anything in the preventative space, which is something that I'm a big advocate for, is you know having on board the right nutrients and the right things, including fish oils, in order that if you are in, in a high risk situation, so you've got uh, you're going to go and play rugby on Saturday, that you've got the nutrients on board in order to prevent the worst and to have the nutrients there should you need it. Uh, would you, you know, agree with that one? Um, that that would be a, a good lot, approach. There's a lot to unpack in those last couple of sentences, and we could spend the next couple hours talking about it. Um, and so two, two big things. One is, uh, the idea of, you know, you mentioned go to the emergency department and go home and rest. And one thing that has finally started to change, but it still has not gotten out, you know, around the world and, and where it should be is that resting is actually not good for concussion. You need to be proactive. You need to be active. So uh, the key words should be that you need an active recovery, not a, not a passive recovery. Uh, a quick story, a friend of mine who was the head of the, uh, uh, one of the major university, uh, the MD, PhD, neurosurgeon, head of the major, major university concussion program. And when I was kind of learning and reaching out to people to, to teach me, and I said, well, what do you do your, with your athletes? And he goes, well, when they have a concussion, I put them on a treadmill the next day and I make them run. And I kind of jokingly said, well, what if they have a headache? And he goes, well, I give them a Motrin and tell them to keep running. Uh, I'm <laughs> not. They just, they just <laughs> yeah. get better that much quicker. And of course, mm -hmm. caveat that with you, you're not putting them back into a game. But no. that aerobic exercise, that blood flow to the brain is an important aspect to help the recovery. So then I'll unpack a second part of what you just talked about briefly is that that being proactive as well, right? Being in a preventive mode. And one of the things, and I've dealt with the U.S. military, I spent 30 plus years in the military, the U.S. military retired quite a number of years ago now. Uh, but one of the things that just I still shake my head about and and it's the same thing with professional sports and college sports university sports and and so on is we talk as you know you look at American football for example and we talk about being um you know getting better equipment and a better helmet and a better this and a better that and but nobody's talking about what can you do from the inside out and the U.S. military is just as guilty of that as anybody. And in fact, I had um, some very elite special operators uh, I, tell me, we've got an unlimited budget to buy anything to protect like, like body armor or to kill people. And 
but it stops right at the mouth. And, wow. Wow. you know, you, we are not allowed to use money and all these unlimited funds to deal with nutrition because that it, was a separate pot of money or different color of money it, as they, they would call it. And it's mm -hmm. like, we're not able to protect the most important thing that a special operator has is their brain mm -hmm. and well, and their, and their body too. But um, they were really, it was amazing. That yeah, it's, it's shocking on anything to kill somebody but not to protect your own brain yeah and I, I, i've got a colleague down here who's um you know actually gone through dr mark gordon's training and um she's been trying to get into our rugby and get them to take uh some preventative supplements just some very basic supplements and they're not allowed and they're literally not allowed to take them um and you know she she was looking at things like inacetylcysteine and and so on as well um and, and it's just like no 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 they're not having it uh and it's like why why are you not being not prevented or are they just so is it the team is, or yeah the, not allowed not allowed the union not allowing because uh i know i've got a friend who is a high level nutritionist with the national hockey league and professional teams in the National Hockey League, and her players take N-acetylcysteine before every game. Well, that, that's what we were hoping to, yeah, yeah because N-acetylcysteine, yeah. I mean, fish oil, obviously we're going to dive into the deep deeps of, of fish oil, but N-acetylcysteine also very powerful as a, as a, you know, being proactive, having that on board for the, that glutathione, those antioxidants to have on board before an injury happens so that you've got something ready to go. And, and inositalcysteine was one in particular that was not allowed, you know. Um, and and I, I just, sometimes I, um, and I've listened to, you know, quite a few of your lectures and I'm just like shaking my head at some of the stories and going, yeah, I've experienced the exact same thing. I've experienced the exact same thing. And it's really, really frustrating, you know, when you know you have something and you want to get this information out to the world and the world does not seem to be listening. And it's some pretty basic stuff too, you know, we're not on so that. that that same colleague, that same night about the thousand year <laughs> remark, yeah. she said to me, she goes, you're in the damnedest position I've ever seen. You've got something we know will work in people, but we've got to prove it in rats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. We've got to go back. And, and, you know, I love your approach. You know, you, you talk, uh, you, you have your brain, brain health education uh, website. Um, help me out there for the URL. Um where that's got all the research that's coming out and, and because you're doing a sort of a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach so to educate via platforms like this plus also get the studies done and get the, the because doctors want studies they want to see the research they want to they want the data they want the cold hard data and you know that's something that i've been frustrated with like my mother's case is an absolute miracle we were actually just the day before yesterday with a neurosurgeon she's got normal tense of hydrocephalus off the back of the aneurysm the stroke the brain cancer the um, number of infections that she's had blah 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 24 odd concussions while she was learning to walk again um, major vestibular problems and I've, I've managed to get on top of every everything except the vestib uh the, except the hydrocephalus because it's water on the brain and i haven't been able to to um get that so we're looking into the possibility of a stent after me not saying for nine years she's got hydrocephalus <laughs> please can somebody look at it and finally i got through to the new neurosurgeon just two days ago and he and then he said to to me you know like when she walked in at 82, after having known her history, having operated her uh, on her nine years ago, nine and a half with the with the aneurysm, he didn't think that she should survive that. And then he operated three years ago when she had a massive brain tumor, and he didn't think she'd survive that. And he just said, you know, like she's the most strongest, most resilient, most incredible case I've ever seen. Um, and I'm going, yeah. And nobody wants to know what I did. Nobody wants to. I've written a book actually called What uh, it took, called Relentless, and how a mother and daughter defied the odds. And it's it's to empower the other people going through this to to listen to the story, to advocate, to fight. Not that it's going to be an easy battle, by the way, but to not okay. give up 
<laughs> to not, you know, we were like, she's she's buggered, put her in an institution. They didn't think she'd survive the first few weeks because she was in and out of coma as that biochemical cascade of inflammation sort of took over and, you know, she lost, she had um, vasospasms and, you know, all of that sort of thing happening, was in and out out of coma they did an amazing job the surgeons put in a, a coiling um uh, to stop the bleed etc and then they realized yep she's going to survive but massive massive brain damage at age 74 put her into an institution nothing you can do she didn't know who she was she was like a baby you know massive and i at the, my desperation started to research and study and realize over the years now i'm you know almost a decade into non-stop study um there is just nothing further from the truth there's so much we can be doing and that i didn't know to do at the beginning we were putting you know mainlining glucose into you know like through feeding tubes and stuff like that and oh my gosh you know like where was the discussion around ketones where was the the right nutrition where was the fish oils where was the you know all of these things hyperbaric oxygen i run a clinic here down in new zealand now with hyperbaric oxygen because that was a cornerstone of her her rehabilitation. Um, and, you know, I, I'm so sad because I could have implemented a lot of that stuff earlier if I had known, hence why I do what I do to educate as many people as I can, not only in brain uh, health, but across the board now. But, um, but, but you know, all this information's out there. And in the clinic, we're like 30 years behind, especially in New Zealand. We're an island in the Pacific with very small resources. And the, like the neurosurgeon said to me the other day, look, I said, what about this procedure that I've read about in the States and blah, 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 blah. Said, that ain't ever going to be here, coming down here for the next 10 years. Don't hold your breath. He said, I'm frustrated too. I can't get the resources to do even the basics, you know. So you need to understand all that and be, you know, proactive. I think, yeah. <laughs> What's your take on that? Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it, it is. I, you know, as you have alluded to, I, you know, I've got, you know, twice as long as you as being frustrated by the medical system. And I am a allopathic, you know, traditionally trained doctor. My father was a small town general surgeon. My mother was a nurse. I went to medical school to be a surgeon. I have been stymied and frustrated for almost 20 years about this whole concept. And uh, one, of, one of the more common things that I get is I get emails from around the world saying, hey, my mother, my brother, my uncle, my cousin is in a coma. Can you talk to the doctors and, and tell them to do something? And the problem is the doctors are going to, they've entrenched in what they know. And I mean, I think back to my medical school days, the, the thought of nutrition came up, but it was write a consult for a nutritionist. I mean, doctors didn't do it with nutrition. And, uh, and everything that I've had to learn in the last 20 years has been on my own, just like you. Uh, I may have had a little more medical background background <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and i've been able to do more from a medical point of view and and see and, and i always say that my patient number one is myself so i i've had enough concussions either from rugby or american football or jumping out of airplanes or whatever um you know i've had enough sporting type of concussions that I, I better take care of myself. And so when I come across something new, I, I'm patient number one. I try it on myself. And, Love it. you know, I've got 18 years of experience of doing that. And so that's been, been really, really helpful. And one thing I'm always open with my patients is say, there's so much we don't know. And if you come across something and you wonder if it might help or work, let me know, because if I don't know anything about it, I'll either give you an opinion about it, or if I don't know anything about it, it gives me something to research so that Love I that. can learn, so yep. that I can help the next patient. So, you know, your job as my patient is to help with Educate. the next patient, the next patient, the next patient. I absolutely adore that uh, approach, and, and I operate the same way as a clinician now, and, you know, 
my my clients are always coming to me with some study and I'm like, I'm overwhelmed with studies that I've got to get through or things that I've got to watch and, and do. But it, it provides me an unending education because it's pushing me in this direction. And they and I, and my clients have given me so much uh, education that way that I've been able to then pass on to the next person exactly the same as what you're explaining. And, and it, but that takes a humble attitude from the clinician, from the doctor, because you, you have to sometimes go back to the drawing board and relearn everything that you were taught. And it could be now wrong and outdated. And you have to have that humble humility to go, okay, maybe we got all that wrong, or maybe things have changed, or maybe we've progressed. And here's my new recommendations based on the science of today you know, what we know today. And of course, the medical knowledge, I heard someone say, I don't know whether this is correct, but every 72 days, uh, the, the knowledge is doubling now with the AI and the things that we have, you know, so none of us are across it all, right? Nobody, nobody's across it all. Except, except some of the things, we really got to get back to the basics on it. And like I said, you know, I wasn't taught anything about nutrition, uh, you know, omega-3s, Kind of vaguely remember if I were to look at a notebook or that I probably don't have from back in medical school days, I it might be there uh, somewhere buried in that, but it wasn't anything that was particularly um, put out, uh, you know, and certainly taught or emphasized. Yeah. So so let's now, Doctor Lewis, actually go and talk about fish oil and brain injuries. Um, omega threes are an essential fatty acids, as is omega sixes. And recently, I just had Dr. Stephanie Ben Watson on, of um, who is works with C15. I don't know if you've come across her research. Um, if you haven't, I'll be sending you some info. I haven't, but C15. C15. Yeah. So this is uh, and it has been classed now as the third essential fatty acid. And, um, we, you know, I'll probably, you know, silo that for a moment because we want to talk about omega-3s and omega-6s first. Um, and, but that's the, their, their research for you would be really, really interesting. So I will definitely, um, you know, send you some stuff to listen to yeah. and, and read. Um, but omega-3s and omega-6s uh, up until now have been the two essential amino, uh, sorry, um, omega three uh, essential fatty acids. Fatty acids. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we've got omega threes that are more. I don't want to say anti-inflammatory, but they're more on that anti-inflammatory side of the equation. And omega sixes that more pro-inflammatory. Uh, and, and we have a hell of a lot more omega sixes in our diet, and that's the problem. So, it's the omega six to omega three ratio is the key factor here. Can you explain a little bit about that, and why is this now skewed? towards the omega-6s and, and so on. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, forgive me if it takes the next two, three hours, but not. <laughs> um, <laughs> so omega-6 and omega-3s, you know, it, it's um, it's two things you got to take into account. How many carbons in, in the length of the, of the molecule? And where is the first double bond? So with omega-6 is the first double bond is six carbons in, and the first double bond on omega-3s is in three carbons in. And they are essential fatty acids, um, you know, and so at the 18 carbon chain, uh, carbon level, they can get elongated to, to 20 and 22. And so, um, so that's part of the process. And omega-6s, are not all bad and omega-3s are not all good and some of the downstream effects, but it's really nature designed our bodies. And, you know, a thousand, 10,000 years ago, omega-6s and omega-3s were generally consumed in a one-to-one -one ratio. And the biggest reason for that is that the enzymes that are used to make and break the omega-3s and the omega-6s are exactly the same. And so to elongate them and put the double bonds in places, all those enzymes are exactly the same. And so that one-to-one -one ratio was how nature designed us. And 100, 200 years ago with the Industrial Revolution, you know, our food processing started to change. And then really about um, the biggest change, at least in the United States, was 
probably around the late 1960s, early 1970s with the advent of corporate farming. Mm -hmm. And what we saw was skyrocketing of the amount of soybean oil that is consumed per person on across the board. And so soybean oil, well, you know, like I don't need soybean oil. <laughs> well, yeah, you do actually. And the, what I mean by that is soy is, soybean is used to feed the animal, which is then, you know, subsequently consumed. And so whether it's that you think you're eating healthier by eating chicken, well, it depends on what the chicken's being fed or even fish and farm raised fish that gives a whole different meaning. Mm. Um, mm. But um, so what's happened is we've become more and more skewed to the omega-6 side of things in our just natural diet. And so it's fat. So if you start to eat really, really healthy, it's still fat and it takes months to years to really change that whole uh, situation within our bodies. And so what I looked at was how do we plus up the other side really quick? And so that's, you know, with omega-3 supplementation. Uh, but let me go back to a little bit of the, the chemistry on that for a half a second. So omega-6 molecules are where that double bond is, starts. Um, it's a very stiff molecule. So stable. And so, yeah. So if you and it's very stable, and therefore the reason why we have so much soybean oil consumed is because of that stability. So we can process foods with it and ship it around the world. Mm. So I, I say you could put a put some crackers out in the sun for three days, and they may be stale, but you could still eat them and, and be fine. You put a piece of fish out in the sun for an hour, you probably don't want to eat it because the omega-3s, because of where the double bonds are, it's a very flexible molecule, but it also makes it very susceptible to spoilage. Mm -hmm. And so we can't process foods with omega-3s and ship it around the world. Mm. And so that gives you a little bit of an idea there. So some of the downstream effects of omega-6s, especially when you get to a 20 carbon chain length of arachidonic acid, are very pro-inflammatory. DGLA, di, I don't, I'm not even going to go into trying to remember mm -hmm. the name, um, <laughs> but DGLA is an omega-6, and its downstream effects are actually anti-inflammatory, okay. so not all mm -hmm. sixes are bad, um, and omega-3s generally, pretty much, they have less inflammatory and some anti-inflammatory properties, so by that nature, they're much better. And it really becomes this fight. It's that one-to-one -one omega-6 to omega-3 ratio has now in across the board in society has become 25 to one yeah. or, or worse. And so we have 25 omega-6 molecules for every one omega-3 molecule. And it's no longer, remember, they're sharing the same enzymes. That's no longer a fair fight. And so where do these molecules get taken up into is into the cell membrane. Mm. And the most concentrated place is actually the retina. Second is most concentrated in the brain. And the third in the ovaries and testicles. Mm. So they speak a little bit on that, but, you know, we'll let that one go. Um, but so when we become a little bit less it's almost hard to say that you become deficient in omega-3s because it's really, you become way over abundant in omega-6s. Gotcha. And, and it's that ratio that becomes important. So that's why if we do blood spot tests and things mm. like that, we're not looking, we, you know, you look at the amount of omega-6s and omega-3s and the, and the breakdown of different ones, but the really the most important number most people don't know is what is their omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. It has everything to do with brain health, heart health, immune health, and so on and so on. Wow. And, and, and yeah, I do, um, you know, fatty acid uh, testing um, uh, panels here. And I'm very often when we see, when we get the panels back, that that omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, the omega-3 to 6 ratio is is very skewed. 
And what is the target that you're going after if you're wanting to be healthy? What is the target of omega-3s to omega-6s that you would like to see in place? Well, one of the things always confuses people, are we talking omega-6 to 3 or are we talking 3 yeah, to 6? Yeah, 3 to 6. So I'll, I'll, I'll just... I, I generally keep it, you know, the mega sixes on on the the numerator of well, even though it's a ratio, it's not a numerator, but on top and omega threes in the bottom. So omega, when I talk about, so for example, uh, about fifteen years ago, I did a study of a couple thousand U, active duty U.S. soldiers, and we determined that the omega six to the omega three ratio was literally twenty six to one. Wow, terrible. And what the so what the and I said one to one is what it should be, but you know, a very good and reasonable healthy target is actually three to one or better. So right. three to one from the omega six to omega three ratio is is really the target that people should be shooting for. Okay, so that's what we're going for. And and so the omega threes have this double bond, so they're very easily oxidized and spoiled so this this comes to then the discussion around the quality of the fish oils that you're getting right and uh we can all go to the supermarket and get a five dollar big you know box of of fish oils why is that not a good idea <laughs> probably well it's actually it's not all right, so it's not what you think and so a lot of people will say that that you know fish oil it's going to be contaminated with uh, with mercury and other heavy metals and pcbs and other things and in fact that's not true at all uh in fact if you know the manufacturing process it's really not even possible and i mean i can go into the manufacturing thing for about a minute but uh if you want me to yeah but it's but it basically all fish oil that's on the market is cleaned of all those things one of the issues is when you clean the fish oil, the way it's, so I'll go on the manufacturer just really quick. The way it is cleaned is they, it's a, generally you squeeze a fish and you get generally triglyceride form. So it's got a glycerin back, backbone and tri, meaning, you know, you got three branches off of that glycerin backbone. So they break that glycerin backbone and now you've got free fatty acids, which are very, very unstable. It's like having sodium without, um, it's like having sodium without chloride. Um, you know, you need an acid and a base to keep it stable. So what they do is they attach it to an alcohol molecule, the free fatty acids. And that's now called an ethyl ester. Mm -hmm. I know, I don't know about New Zealand, but I know in Australia, you're not allowed to call that ethyl ester. Um, I don't know who wants to keep calling me here. Um, <laughs> okay. the, you're not allowed to call that ethyl ester fish oil because it's actually no longer an oil. That's good. And so, mm -hmm. and so, um, at least that's what it was, and I'm assuming still is in Australia. Yeah, um, I'm not sure here. So what what cheap companies do is they put it. It's a really caustic material if you will and so they put it into a gelatin capsule and stick it on the on the supermarket shelf for you know five dollars a bucket and it's really cheap so that natural level that you get is generally about a third what i call a 30 percent concentration this is where the problem is it's not in the 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 potential for spoilage it's not in the um it's not in the PCBs and mercury and stuff like that. It's the percentage of what you take a thousand milligram capsule and has 180 milligrams of EPA and 120 milligrams of DHA, 300 milligrams of combined EPA DHA, right? You add those two up, you got 300 milligrams. What's the other 700 milligrams? I have no we idea. We don't know. <laughs> We don't know. They don't tell you. There's no analysis that shows what all that, that you know, 70% of what you're taking, we don't know what it is. And, and it's so an ethyl ester, biggest, isn't it? It's and it's an, an ethyl ester. And so even the, the pharmaceutical is at least what you can get a, a hold of in yeah. the United States or yep. also in the ethyl ester form. The only difference is they concentrate 
the the molecules so that it's a 70 to 90 percent concentration and then they put it in a capsule and sell it to you for 30 dollars a capsule uh um, unnecessarily so, and it's still that ethyl ester. <laughs> and it's still cheap and it's still an ethyl ester now there are a few good companies around the world that reverse that process and they concentrate it and then they reverse it and they re they recombine it get re, they recombine it with the uh, glycerin backbone and they can make it now uh, technology has where we can make up to a 90% concentration so a couple companies i know of that have I'll throw out the numbers 1250 milligram capsules they're a little bit bigger capsules but they have 600 milligrams of EPA and 400 milligrams of DHA. So a thousand milligrams of omega threes in a 1250 capsule. Yeah. And that's a great concentration, but it costs a heck of a lot more because it's also in a triglyceride form. Yeah. And so it, you get what you pay for. And if you were to look at it dollar per milligram or however you want to kind of figure that out, you're far better off paying more for a good quality. Uh, that's not going to upset your stomach and give you reflux and other problems as well. Because the, the ethyl ester, we don't basically, we don't have the enzymes. The, the body doesn't recognize it as an oil that we've seen for millions <laughs> of years and, and digested. It's it's We haven't got the machinery to break it down, basically. And exactly. When it's in the triglyceride or the phospholipid form, then we're able to break it down. And, and the concentration of that EPA and DHA in there is also... Uh, a, a really good point. So, so you want to be looking at the package. You want to see if it doesn't say it's a triglyceride or a phospholipid, then it's probably an ethyl ester, and you probably want exactly. to go somewhere else. And um, you know, probably you know, people can reach out to me if they want to know some brands because I don't like to you know talk about brands too much on the on the um, podcast. But there, there are good ones in there. You know, probably what's in your supermarket is probably not going to be the best option for you. And you're going to have to take a heck of a lot more. Um, is there a problem with you, it you being... Gen you generally got to go to either a, yeah. a health food store Prescription or, or, or yeah, a clinician. pharmacy kind of thing. Yeah. Is, is there a problem also with the oxidized... Is it oxidized, the cheaper form, or no? That's not an issue. It's it's not really an issue. I mean, you know, I certainly wouldn't be sitting it out. Um, it's why it comes in a, either a dark bottle, a glass bottle, or or plastic, and they'd say keep in a, a cool, dry place. And so, yeah, if you had it out, uh, you know, outside the bottle sitting in the sun, it's going to oxidize and depends on the quality. But uh, but for the most part, not usually going to be an issue in the time that the expiration date is now right. up an interesting thing when they do that whole cleaning process one of the things that they do is they they they're so focused on epa and dha that they clean out all the other good things the polyphenols and uh the, and the other good antioxidants and you don't get those Mm. And so they typically uh, official all add in like vitamin E to keep it, try to keep it from oxidizing. Mm -hmm. um, I just came across a, a, new, a Norwegian company in the last couple of months who it's funny. They reached out to me 11 years ago, asking me, uh, wanting to connect about a project and uh, we never connected for some reason. And then about three months ago, they reached out a second time and said, Hey, this is the project we were working on. And what they figured out is how to add in those good polyphenols and good things back into the fish oil. Wow. But they realized you couldn't do it with fish. And so what they do is they combine it with super high quality extra virgin olive oil. Mm -hmm. And so you get the polyphenols and the protective effects from the combination from the olive oil that helps protect the fish oil. Wow. And you get the benefits directly from extra virgin olive oil, as we know, is also a good thing. So it's yeah. like a 60, 60 percent high quality fish oil, 40 percent olive oil. Um, oh, wow. Olive that's, so that's a new technology that just this one. So is that Nordic Naturals or someone else? Or No, it's uh, Nordic Naturals out of California, the United States, although, you know, I, they've got a manufacturing plant in, um, in Norway. Um, but it's a company out of Oslo. 
uh, mm. named Zinzino, Z-I-N-Z-I-N-O. Mm. Okay, uh, I'll have a look and, at that one. Cause that's new actually, technology. Well, they're just now get, they're just now coming into the U.S. Ninety eight percent of their business is Europe and around the world. I'd oh. be surprised if they're they're not in New Zealand. New Zealand, yeah, I'll have a look. I haven't they're, I haven't come they're, across they're that. Just come, they're, yeah. they're just coming. I'll, I can get you more information on that, but um, they're just now coming into the U.S. Okay. Now that, one that's... of the other things they do is they they combine it. They like to combine it, and they they really urge you to do blood spot testing as part of it. Because how do you know mm -hmm. it's being effective if you're not testing? Yep. And so you know they they typically they've got one program where they'll give you a test a, a test at the beginning. Uh, and after a couple of months, they send you a second test so you can see how well you. Wow. And wow. So that's it's a, it's gold. a really nifty little program. Yeah, that's great because, yeah, what you can test when it's when the testing's not too expensive, um, the, you know, getting it before and after really helps you motor stay motivated, right? Because sometimes with supplements, no, you don't know, like you don't feel necessarily, doesn't mean it's not working. It just means that, you, you, you know, like I don't know, I'm methylating right now a million billion times. I, I, I don't feel <laughs> it, right? I don't feel that. But when something goes wrong, then I'll feel it. But uh, you, people, you know, expect to take a supplement and, you know, feel like they've had a red ball or something. And it's uh, that's not the case. That's not how it works. <laughs> I try to get people out of that instant there, mindset. There are some exceptions. There are some people who are really are. sensitive to things. But, uh, but you know, I, I know. And I test them out on I, – I, I've got one of those as a good friend. And I, you know, after I test myself, test something on myself, I tested it on him because he's very, very sensitive to things. It gives me <laughs> great yeah, that's brilliant. <laughs> um, so so let's now talk. You've got a couple of cases that I did want to highlight that I've heard you talk about uh, that were quite astounding and might give people, you know, some insights as to why you actually, you know, stumbled into this too. And, and uh, there was a, a young man, Bobby, I believe his name was, um, in a car accident. Can you share that that story? It was, you know, quite a while ago. Um, uh, was it Bobby? Was, um, was it Bobby now? I can't remember. Yeah. 14 years ago, March right. 2010. Uh, and I was just, I was still trying to figure out what was going on and which end was up. And I, like I said, I had to teach myself <laughs> all these things. And I got a call one day. And it's, you know, I'll give you the short version. The longer one is like, you, you know, the, the how these things happen is just amazing. Uh, but I get a call one day and, and you know, Bobby's been in an accident. Would I talk to the father about uh, putting him on fish? Well, like the um, survivor of a of an infamous coal mine accident had been a couple, uh, about a year or so earlier. Mm -hmm. And well, actually a couple of years earlier. And um and so there's one guy that survived, 23, 24, five-year-old, uh, who out of 20-some guys, they all died except for this one who was an inch away from death. And short of it, they ate everything from hyperbaric to dialysis because kidney and liver failure, massive heart attack from the methane gas poisoning and, and carbon wow. monoxide poisoning. And they were left with a guy who was essentially brain dead. And they're like, well, no, well now what do we do? And somebody had the idea, Look, let's flood them with fish oil and see what happens. And the guy walked out of the hospital a couple of months later. So the guy, the call I got was, would would Bobby benefit from this high dose fish oil like the Sago mine accident survivor did? And I like literally, I was on it. I was like, I don't know. It's never been tried before. And so the next thing, you know. I talked to the father. I said, I didn't even know what to do or how, how much to give. And, you know, I said, go to a Whole Foods, you know, grocery store down the street from the hospital where you are and buy, buy this product. How much to take? Um, I just kind of made it up. <laughs> uh, just a wild guess. I like take a. Because Bobby was ML dying, store. basically. He was in the ICU and they were going to pull the plug. Yeah. Twice a day. And so, yeah, yeah the. He was in a bad car accident, medevac, aerovac out, um, and the parents were told, pull the plug. He has no chance of surviving. And 
So this was a couple of days afterwards and Bobby refused to die. And so the parents were desperate. How, you know, what are we, you know, what are we, what are we doing? And the doctors are saying, there's nothing we can do. Only time will heal his brain. We really think you should just pull the plug because nothing's going to help him. And so I convinced the neurosurgeon, you got no, you got nothing to lose. Why don't you try the fish oil? And it was 15 mLs. Uh, no, it was, yeah, it was 15 mLs twice a day, and you know, push down his feeding tube. And said, all right, well, we got nothing to lose. And Bobby went to his high school graduation three months later. Amazing. And That's an amazing so that, story. He, now he, you know, he's if that was 2010, so it's 14 years later. Um, He's basically a stroke victim, right? He's got some one-sided weakness and, you know, slow, deliberate speech, but uh, he's, he's, alive. Got a college, he's got a college degree now. Wow. Uh, um, you know, lives in an apartment and is, you know, dating and, you know, independent. Almost, an independent, almost, you know, as normal as you could expect life. When wow. That's amazing. We're just told. Pull the plug. He has no chance of surviving. Uh, and, and, you know, like um, my listeners know a story with my dad. Uh, he was um, had sepsis, getting a little bit off topic. He had sepsis and um, they operated. Uh, they he had an aortic aneurysm and then developed sepsis off the back of the, the operation. And I was aware of all the uh, research around intravenous vitamin C. Uh, Dr. Paul Marek, who's done studies and others, um, showing that the sepsis, you know, that the mortality rates drop like 50% if you can get early access to intravenous vitamin C. And I came with the research and I, you know, desperate to to save my dad because we were running out of options or they, they'd run out of options and they were telling us to take him off life support and I was fighting. And I had to fight like 16 days against the ethics committee. And I say that with gritted teeth um, uh, because they wouldn't, they didn't give a shit to be honest about with you about the clinical research. They only cared about what was the legal ramifications if they gave them. And I said, oh, I'll sign whatever you want me to sign. It's my full responsibility if, you know, something goes wrong, but he's dying. And then they said, well, you know, vitamin C has been shown that could could damage his kidneys. I'm like, what part of dead do you not understand? You know, like, you know, just absolutely ridiculous arguments, in other words. And it took me 16 days of fighting. I finally found a, a legal loophole where my GP could come into the hospital and administer the vitamin C as his as his GP. Um, and we, we got the first one in, but they would only do half of the dose that I was asking for. And it was meant to be every six hours. The doctor could only come twice a day in between clinic. And then they played all sorts of games to make sure that it, you know, when I when when she was coming up, they'd call me out of the room and oh, there's no line available. And she says like, well, what's that line for? And they said, well, that's for emergency. And I'm like, what the frick is this? You know, like this is an emergency. You know, and so there was all sorts of. So I'm very, 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 very uh, skeptical about well, you know these is, things. I, yeah, I get emails like I said are from around the world um, and asking for help. And one of the biggest issues is doctor saying you know pull the plug there's no chance of survival or any kind of meaningful recovery so just let them go and pull you know let them die uh oh, but no we can't give them fish oil because that might hurt them exactly what i just i i don't <laughs> the disconnect there doesn't ever make any sense like the side that you know like fish oil might hurt them you should just let them die yeah <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Like uh, vitamin C is going to hurt his kidneys. Don't we, we can't do that. And it basically comes down to their legal backsides on the line. And that's why I'm very, I, I want to get a law change where we have the right to try when you're at the end of life, they've run out of options. You should have the right to try these experimental things. And vitamin C is not experimental, by the way, there's like 50,000 studies. I keep wondering <laughs> you know? when, when did nutrition become the enemy? or experimental <laughs> exactly and, and people ask me just on a regular basis you know how long how long should i take fish oil and i'm like how long do you plan on eating <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly because this is because this gets back to the other thing like 
omega threes make up. I heard. I, correct me if I'm wrong. Thirty percent of the brain fat is the, omega threes. Right, the, the 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 fat of the brain is about thirty percent uh, omega threes. I don't know what. The, so the brain's made of fat. I mean, you know, it's yeah. why we got the term fat head and other things, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and you know, the the probably the I would argue the three most important fats are cholesterol, mm -hmm. omega sixes, and mm -hmm. omega threes. And so we need all three. And you can't build a brain without them. And you can't build a brain. In fact, uh, omega threes are so important that a mother will give up her own stores of omega threes from her own brain to help the fetus develop. Um, you know, wow. we're talking about calcium. Right. We always, everybody knows about calcium, right? You got to mm. make sure, you know, for the baby, for the bones. Well, no comments. <laughs> so, and also in the breast milk, the mother will give up her own omega 3. So, pregnant women really need to be consuming more omega 3s. It should be wow. absolutely standard for ev every obstetrician. And what happens when you don't? When you have, I mean, this has been shown over and over and over and over again. In fact, you know, the study I alluded to with the U.S. military showed that low DHA, low omega-3 levels correlated to a 62% increased risk of suicide. Yeah. Talk about yeah. mental health. Wow. <laughs> so, wow. you know, when you have low omega-3 levels, you're more susceptible to mental health issues. Was anybody ever heard of postpartum depression? Right. So if you're getting, you know, low omega, you're giving up omega threes and you're, because you're pregnant and you're giving them to your, your fetus to grow a brain. Yeah. So we don't think of these things. It's like, we don't, can't put a, a can't get from a to B to C to D. It's too complicated. <laughs> and so it's just really, really frustrating because Part of the reason why I hesitated to even start asking these questions, because to me, be, not being a neurologist, not being a neurosurgeon, uh, being an outsider, uh, I just thought it was, I couldn't believe these things weren't being done or talked about. I, I, I put two uh, and two together, I came up with an odd number, and, um, and I'm like, what do you mean nobody's asking these questions? It seems really obvious to me. And now, almost 20 years later, I'm still asking the same questions. And it still seems even more obvious to me. And yet, and me. it's not anywhere near mainstream. <laughs> and if you think you're an outsider, wait till you're someone like me who comes from an athletic <laughs> background and doesn't have a medical background initially, um, then you're really an outsider and pushing uh, the proverbial uphill when you're trying to get changed. And that's why, you know, I go through these forums because I just bring in the experts, let them talk because th I've done the research. I know the things that I know the people that should be getting a voice and, and I share it that way. And, or I write a book um, and <laughs> about it, you know, so I've written a few books and, you know, um, it, it just baffles me. It's the same with cancer. My mum had the CNS lymphoma, um, you know, an aggressive uh, form of, of, of uh, cancer in the brain. And we were, this was just three years ago and given weeks to live, nothing she could do. Um, and, you know, there's nothing further from the truth. And now I've written a book called What Your Oncologist Isn't Telling You. And, um, you know, it's all <laughs> 21 interviews with the world's leading metabolic uh, approach to cancer people um, and sharing that information, not my information, just what I did and what they do and what the science is saying and giving people the both sides of the equation. Here's the side with the chemo, the surgery, radiation, and here's the side with the metabolic, the hyperbaric, the intravenous vitamin C, the peptides, all the rest of it. You make mm -hmm. a fully informed decision now. And, and good luck fighting the oncology because they will not <laughs> accept the, any of this other stuff. And that's the hard part, right? But at least they've got that information in front of them and they can make the choices to the best of their ability, you know? Um, but mm -hmm. it, it, we need to, we need, we definitely need change without going off on a tangent because I, I do want to stick to the, um, to the mm -hmm. omega threes. I mean, with, with the, with the DHA and EPA, these are the, the constituents of, 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 of 
types of uh, omega threes. Can you explain what the DHA and the differences between the DHA and the EPA? Because we hear those terms, but we may not uh, understand those. Right. Without throwing out the long uh, chemical names, so eighteen carbons is ALA, and that gets elongated, desaturated to EPA. And then that further gets um, elongated and desaturated to uh, DPA. So from 18 to 20 to 22 carbons in length. And so ALA, which you get from leaky green vegetables, flaxseed and walnuts and, and other healthy things, um, absolutely great things to eat. But EPA and DHA are generally derived or, from animal meat and particularly most concentrated in seafood. And so, but you have to look at that, that process, right? A, you're swimming uphill uh, because of the omega-6 situation, but the typical conversion from 18 to 20 to 22 carbons in length. So ALA, you consume all day long and only somewhere between less than one and maybe as much as two or three or four percent will ever get made into DHA and found in the brain. I mean, they've done radio label mm. studies to show it um, over and over again. In fact, one study was like 0.04 percent ever gets, you know, a radio labeled ALA, consume it, and only 0.04 percent was found in the brain. And so um, so what are the differences? There's very little a uh, EPA. So we consume a ah, geez, let me get a straight here. <laughs> consume EPA, consume EPA and DHA generally, you know, seafood is your best source of it. And um, and so that's what we call it a, a fish oil supplement. It's not meant to be a replacement, or we wouldn't call it, it is a supplement. You should be eating seafood on a regular basis, salmon being probably the highest. Um, and, you know, there's different types of salmon and this, that, and the other. But let's stick with just seafood. Um, EPA and DHA. So EPA is generally the downstream effects. That, so they get incorporated into the cells. And when they're released from the cell membrane, they have downstream effects. And the EPA is generally the heart healthy one. It EPA helps keep our blood from clotting, uh, and which is like an aspirin a day type of you know keeps a keeps our blood from clotting and and is relatively anti-inflammatory, counter to that of the omega sixes, right? And so downstream effects of arachidonic acid omega six is to help the blood clot. Well, clearly that needs to be a balance. But inflammation is also meant to be a balance. You mm. you twist your ankle, you need to be repaired. You have a rough rugby game and you're just sore all over. That's all that's inflammation. And we need to, yeah, so we need inflammation. I always say inflammation is life. Mm. You gotta have it. Even the person that's not playing rugby, um, you know, you're bombarded all day. 24 7 by uh the radiation from the sun and on the radiation from the earth you're breathing uh, if you live in a city in particular you're breathing not so clean air all these things are constantly bombarding our bodies and we need sleep to recover and repair that but we need to be able to handle that with the anti-inflammatories right so that that radiation from the sun is causing microscopic inflammation we need to resolve that inflammation well so epa is really the heart healthy one for that mm -hmm. dha is what then gets incorporated in the cell membranes i said earlier is the most concentrated three places are the retina in the back of the eye the brain about 30 percent of the the brain fat is omega-3s d and dha in particular very little EPA found in the brain, but it may be that it gets consumed so quickly that we can't find mm. it. But we'll focus on DHA. So EPA, best way to remember it, EPA is the heart healthy uh, one. DHA is the brain healthy one. But 
We also know that EPA is really important for mental health. In fact, probably more important for mental health than DHA. Mm. So people say, well, you know, mm. with a brain How's injury, that? you only need, <laughs> yeah, well, well, for a brain injury, you only need DHA. Well, no, I would argue, I, I kind of take the approach and whatever your beliefs are, or whatever. I just say, God put them both here. It's not me to argue with God. So, you know, I think both are important, but for different reasons. Any inflammation in the brain, but you also need the downstream effects of the DHA. And they have some interesting names like resolvins and yes. protectins. Yes. And so those downstream effects when the DHA is released from the cell membrane, resolvins and protectins, Kind of tells you what they do and why they're important. resolve inflammation, protect, <laughs> and so they help resolve our inflammation and protect the brain. But it gets so much more complicated. Um, you know, the interaction with our endogenous cannabinoid system, for example, which it gets way complicated. So all our fatty acids act in mm -hmm. one way or another through our, our cannabinoid system. And so arachidonic acid, for example, gets made into and broken down into something called arachidonal, from arachidonic acid, arachidonal ethanolamide, which is really more known as anandamide or bliss molecule. It's uh -huh. a very short half-life, gets, gets made, and it's, it's now what we know is causes a runner's high. And hmm. so that endorphin rush as we used to call it, is actually anandamide from arachidonic acid. Wow. Well, on the DHA side, it gets made into something called um, docosahexanol ethanolamide, or you know, something that's a little easier to remember or say is synaptamide. Mm -hmm. So DHA gets made into this synaptamide, which helps make longer branchier synapses and more synapses in the brain and so this is all through the cannabinoid system and it gets really complicated and it's not just the ethanolamides the serotonins the do the dopamines and on and on and on the how arachidonic acid and dha and epa and all the the c15s and all the all of these get made into you know these different things that we're just now scratching the surface to try to understand. One wow. of them, for example, from palmitic acid, which nobody talks yeah. about. Um, yep. Palmitoyl. Uh, ethanolamide. Palmitoyl ethanolamide. I e take that, yeah. And, a, yeah. Right? and that's a cannabinoid with, activator, CB1 it's, and CB2. It's a cannabinoid, right. And yeah. so... Right, it comes from plants, and we huh. can take that, and it helps with pain and and other things. So, I uh, don't you see? Yeah, you could. Wow, well, I've if got. You're a, I... If you're a biochemistry nerd, science, you can get into this for years. All day long. <laughs> and, and it's I've way been... over my head, anyway. <laughs> it, it actually, been, it has thrown up a whole lot of questions for me. So, so bear, <laughs> bear, bear with me. When you say uh, the retina is has so high concentrations of the DHA go into the retina, so would that support uh, eye health? You know, like uh, are we? Hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that that's a good question. Um, and then the depression study that you, uh, with the suicide study, you, you, you did a study of, of uh, veterans, I believe it was 800 veterans who uh, had committed suicide, yeah, active mm -hmm. duty, sorry, uh, who had committed suicide. And then your controls and what you found was very low levels of omega-3s, correct? Um, correct? So there is a, a strong connection perhaps with uh, suicide, depression, mental health mm -hmm. side of that equation. Um, and then when you mentioned actually uh, the cannabinoid, so um, so the PEA, I, I you know um, am a fan of that. I take that uh, and for digestive health, but also for the 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 pain uh, reduction um, and uh, for, for I have it in my mum's protocol. Um, mm -hmm. And there's another one called PDC. Uh, something something carnitine, carnitine. 
um, mm-hmm. that is a downstream metabolite of the C15 that I mentioned earlier. And that's a full acting cannabinoid activator as well. The CB1 and the CB2, I probably butchered that science, but um, the, 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 uh, the, the cannabinoid system so we think of it in in relation to marijuana. Everyone sort of knows it in relation well, to that's marijuana. Where, that's that's where it got the name. <laughs> it got the name, but it's actually right. yeah. it's not just marijuana that does that, and has lots of positive sides of it, doesn't it? The cannabinoid receptors. Can you yeah you know, elaborate how maybe the fish oils so they yeah. are sort of downstream metabolites of this? Just, it, absolutely. So just. Really quick. So the reason why it's called the the cannabinoid system was because an Israeli researcher back in the '60s did, uh, for whatever reason, uh, he just passed away last year, I believe. Um, but for whatever reason, he set out to figure out what's the chemical structure of THC. And once he figured that out, and he's like, just had one of those moments, I guess, and he's like, well, wait a minute, THC, you know, how does that interact with the brain and and cause somebody to have euphoria and so he figured out either he or somebody else figured out okay there's these receptors that the thc interacts with that cause you to get high well it turns out so that's how it got named cannabinoid receptors and so the first one was cb1 you know type one in the brain and eventually uh, figured out you know there's cb2 receptors that are more associated with our immune system and then what we now know is there's hundreds of different types of cannabinoid receptors. Like I talked about the serotonin receptors and the dopamine receptors and the ethan- um, uh, ethanolamide receptors and so on and so on. Um, there's, so we now know that the cannabinoid system actually is the most complex, most abundant receptor system in the entire human body. Wow. And you think about it is 50 years ago, we didn't even really know about it. And um, and so it, here's an interesting thing. I talked about anandamide, you know, um, arachidonyl ethanolamide that interacts and its principal action is to interact with the CB1 type receptors found with nerve tissues, you know, obviously the brain. Um, but um, if you look at the chemical structure of arachidonyl ethanolamide and THC, they look nothing alike. Mm. <laughs> and so wait a minute, this so that you know you we went from THC to figure out that there's the CB1 receptors and why do we have CB1 receptors not for THC? Turned out it's for synaptamide, right? Mm-hmm. And so how does that all mix together? And the only way I can really best explain it is like putting your hand in a glove, right? So ethanol, um, arachidonyl ethanol, and an anamide is like putting your fingers into the five finger holes of a glove. Mm-hmm. THC is like trying to put your fist into a glove. Wow. It'll go okay. into the glove, but it's not a good, it's not a real not a good fit. fit right? Yep. Um, and that's actually, but it's enough to cause that euphoria. Wow. And so you know, bring up CBD, right? Uh, cannabidiol, the so the counter to THC, but also found in the cannabis plant. The reason why CBD works is it kind of hits the side of the glove and knocks the your fist out of the glove, uh, knocks the THC off the off the receptors. So wow. that's one of one of the multiple ways that it all works. Um, and again, it gets really complicated really fast. Some of it I understand, some of it I can explain, some of it goes woof, right over my head. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, and we really are scratching the surface. So, you know, um, just to go back to, uh, I, I will send you the uh, the interview that I did with Dr. Stephanie Van Watson and the C15 story um, and cellular fragility syndrome. I hope I got that right, but it's uh, the C15 particularly has some special things about it, and you'd probably understand more than I do uh, if you listen to it, but I I did want to put that on your radar because apparently this is quite a 
something that you might want to add into the protocols that mm -hmm. could uh, help with the whole fish oil story because you know and, and that's exactly actually what I'm doing with my mum's protocol I have fatty 15 I have the fish mm -hmm. oils now on your dosing recommendation so uh, that you have on on your website which is not personalized medical advice anyone listening but there are some things there that you can read um I've got her on the high dose. I did want to ask you, because people are going to ask, um, is that going to thin the blood too much? Uh, what about people that are on warfarin or, you know, other blood thinners, aspirin? Um, so mum is on three capsules of 1,000 combined DHA EPA three times a day. So that's nine capsules a day. And I've been doing that now for the last couple of weeks. Um, along with the fatty 15 um, that she's on as well, and a third mm -hmm. one called plasmalogens, which I'll talk about. Have you come across plasmalogens before? I have. Not... That one's a new one. I'm okay. Uh, I'm a little bit familiar with the fatty 15. Okay. Look, well, oh, yeah, I'm quite excited to be able to share those two with you because I think they're actually very interesting and could add to this I, I've, whole story. I've had, I've had a number of people point me in the direction of fatty 15 in, in the last six months so well there you go maybe uh, uh maybe serendipity <laughs> it's very interesting and it's again newish research and uh you know there's a lot more work to be done it, it came from the navy dolphins pods they were working with and finding that these had certain ones had um much more age-related diseases, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, Alzheimer's, dolphins get Alzheimer's, uh, metabolic disorders. In the in the dolphins that were not fed candlefish, so candlefish are very, very, very high in fish oils, right? Uh, very fatty mm -hmm. fish, very fatty fish. And so when they changed it to, because the candlefish were, stocks were dwindling, so they changed the uh, diet of these Navy dolphins who live much longer in, in with, with the Navy than they do in the wild, um, but they were getting all these age-related diseases. And then they found when they swapped them back onto the candlefish that these these diseases um, diminished and, and uh, did a, lot, a whole lot of studies on, on that. And then Dr. Stephanie reached out to, um, I think it was Jeff Swimmer, who is a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and said, hey, our dolphins are getting in, in, NAFLD, um, and we've been able to reverse it with the C15. And uh, I'm probably butchering the story, but anyway, <laughs> he goes, they can't be having the same disease send me some tissue samples he looks at the tissue samples and says yeah we are good to go this is the exact same disease and exact same thing and so then they became aware of the the c15 connection for non-alcoholic fatty liver and then they've gone on to do other uh research in other areas and again it's in the membrane this is the the basically mm -hmm. the brain of the cell is the membrane the membrane is everything you 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 have good fats and good things then you know good membranes then you're going to be a lot better off than if you're having shitty deep fried foods and things like that, or the stuff that we've been talking about. So uh, yeah, just to put that on your radar, uh, could be an extra good addition to what you're doing or an area of research. Mm -hmm. um, and the third one was, um, there's a Dr. Dayan Goodnow, D-A-Y-A-N, Goodnow, so G-O-O-D-E-N-O-W-E, and I've interviewed interviewed Dr. Goodnow and um, he works with one of my mentors so I know quite a lot about him and his work he's written a book called Breaking Alzheimer's and this is the plasmalogen story so plasmalogens are again uh, produced in the cell in the peroxisome I believe listen to Dr. Goodnow in case I get stuff wrong but um we make a lot of plasmalogens. There's a lot in breast milk. Um, our babies get a lot. It helps with brain development. And these are very sturdy. Uh, no, they, they're very um, good at putting out fires. So if you have a virus, if you have immune activation, if you have anything, like our body sacrifices plasmalogens to put out the inflammation and the problem, put out the fire. If you don't refill your lake with more plasmalogens, then you're going to have issues. So mm -hmm. my brain as a layperson, right, in this world of fats, <laughs> um, is going, this is the, the greatest combination on the planet, isn't it? 
high dose fish oils with fatty uh, fatty 15 and plasmalogens there's two types there's glia and there's neuro glia is more for the myelin sheath um remyelinating the the uh neurons or the yeah the neurons and then the neuro the the plasmalogen that's called neuro increases the the connectivity of the at, at the synapse so you have a bit stronger transmission so so it's been he's done lots of research in alzheimer's in cognitive decline in cancer um helping um in the aftermath of a kill phase in cancer uh to stop the cancer spreading uh autism um so so yeah very very interesting interesting research um and i have all three of those in mum's protocol um and as a neurosurgeon said the day before yesterday, I've never seen anybody's brain be as good as hers is for what it's gone through. She's got she's got some disabilities, uh, mostly balance related issues. But he, he's you know so I don't know. I'm doing a lot of things. I'm doing a lot of things with <laughs> her. So it could be a, a, any number of things. But uh, we're doing something right. But I just wanted to put those two on your radar because That's they're quite. That fascinating research and anything that we can do in this realm to improve that whole brain health and to people that are having repeated brain injuries through sports or blast trauma or things you know like all of these should be on your radars to go and do some more deep diving into it um yeah did that make any any sense and i've probably it made, watched total, it. it made total sense no absolutely <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I, I, I have the privileged position of having, you know, interviewed hundreds of amazing scientists in their areas of specialty. And while my knowledge is surface level, sometimes you get to connect dots that um, because you, you, you have a general, you know, um, education and sometimes you make some interesting connections that, that could possibly lead somewhere. I don't know but it could be an interesting combination to be looking at. <laughs> but um, coming back to the, 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 the omega-3 story, so dosing schedules, what are you recommending for your average healthy person doesn't have a brain injury? What should they be consuming on a day-to-day -day basis? I would say the easiest, broad, general way to approach it is without saying anything about brand or quality or anything like that is whatever bottle you pick up at the store there's going to be a recommended dose typically two capsules for example uh, but there'll be a typically a recommended dose a really if you, the average person if you take twice that you're probably going to be doing okay you're going to be doing better than most people who aren't taking anything. Um, so generally that's that's like the most broad way of approaching it that I can think of is whatever you take, take it. twice the recommended dose. Um, whether it's twice a day or four capsules in the morning, whatever is easier for you. But uh, that's that's the easiest approach without even going into the quality, the quantity and everything else. So hopefully that helps. Um, yeah. Like, and like, if you've got a brain injury or you're dealing with neuro, you know, cognitive decline of some way, shape or form, or you've got somebody in the ICU who's just had a car accident, well, what sort of things? Different things. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Okay. So, so, so step me through what your reasoning would be without this being personal medical advice, obviously, but. No, absolutely. So the, the, the broad approach, the way I look at it is in sort of your every day, not in a coma, in the hospital, the, the the walking, talking person. The approach that I take is everybody is relatively deficient in omega-3s. They have way too many because, right, it's not so much a deficiency of omega-3s, but it has so much omega-6s. So again, you could try to decrease the sixes all day long, but it's going to take months to years to really make mm. a difference. And can you really make a difference? So I look at the other side of the equation. How do we up the omega-3s and 
do you really want to start feeling better in six months or maybe a little bit quicker? And so I start people on a loading dose. I kind of do the, I don't build up. I start high or not. I don't, I don't believe it's high, no. but I'll start, I'll start a loading dose and with the goal of coming down to a, you know, a recommended dose or depend on the, the quality of the, of the supplement, a twice the recommended dose. So I'm going to go, you know, four to five to, you know, six to even nine times higher of the recommended dose as a loading dose for at least a week, if not a month, depending on the situation, and then try to come down because, A, it's going to make you go broke by spending that much money on fish oil. <laughs> but B is, you know, the bigger amounts that you take, there is the slight potential risk, although it's never been shown in, a, in any clinical trial of bleeding issues, but theoretically it, it can, but those are only at the really, really, really high levels. I, I never recommend levels that should cause anybody have an issue. I'll back up for half a second. You did sort of ask or bring up the idea of, you know, blood thinners and things mm. like that. Yes. So my big question, I kind of take the opposite approach. The doctor won't let me take fish oil because I'm on a blood More thinner. morphine or something. And, um, yeah. How about like, why don't you decrease the amount of the blood thinner to adjust for the fish oil? Because one of those is helping the brain and one of them isn't. Yeah. And, <laughs> exactly. and so maybe you should decrease the blood thinner to adjust for any blood thinning, you know, that you, you're getting from the fish oil because yeah. that's what's helping the brain. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't always win the argument. With no, the that's not, lo it's, not what <laughs> it's not a drag and uh, that's not logical. You know. So hopefully it makes sense. I, I, without giving any kind of specific amounts, I, I do a loading dose and then try to come down and that loading dose, depending on the concentration, the quality of the fish oil can be anywhere from multiple, you know, multiple yeah, times so, higher. Yeah. Um, you know, so like the one brand that I typically use all uh, that, the recommended dose is two capsules a day. I have people take nine a day. Yeah, uh, three, that's what we're doing. Spread it mm. out. Spread it out over the over the day. Um, this new uh, liquid fish oil that's combined with the with the olive oil, I'm finding is so much better absorbed. I'm I'm think yeah, I haven't been using it long enough to really work out how much. Um, a typical dose is about ten mLs. And I'm thinking, you know, 15 mLs twice a day is a is a pretty good would probably be a pretty good loading dose. Wow. Um, and then then get down to once a day. So it just depends on the quality. And like I said, I'm really excited about this Zenzino product uh, because of Zeno. the adding mm. the polyphenols in through the olive oil with the with the, to go with the fish oil. It makes it the synergy between the two of them seems to really be making a much bigger difference. Well, it's a bit like a Mediterranean diet, isn't it? With fish and some you, polyphenol vegetables, it's, if you think about it's, it. It's, one, of, one of my good friends calls it a, a Mediterranean diet in a bottle. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it, it makes a whole lot of sense to me um, <laughs> because, yeah, polyphenols have all of their benefits as well, and you put those together, and nature has done that, right? Every time you look at nature, it has combined what we've had in our food is to be, it's developed to right. to work together. I, I've been asking so, probably 10 years, like why don't companies put astaxanthin back into the fish oil? I mean, it's getting yeah. lost with the, with the cleaning process. Why don't they put it back in? Well, it turns wow. out it would take a lot more fish and, and the technology and it's just not there. Um, you know, you, what you have to do to isolate the astaxanthin and, and it's just, and then this company figured out, oh, we don't have to do it from fish. And it doesn't have to be astaxanthin. We can get some really good stuff out of extra virgin olive oil. Yeah. I mean, I take astaxanthin on top of the polyphenols on top of the fish oil. So I must be really <laughs> well covered because <laughs> astaxanthin is one of my uh, favorite yeah, things too. We probably take, you and I probably take way too many things, you know, and it's Guilty. I'm always trying to figure out. <laughs> 
not only how do I decrease my stuff, but you know, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, cause we can get access to things that people don't always have access to. So uh, I'm always trying to figure out how to decrease the amount of what I'm asking people to purchase and to take. That's a very good point. It's very easy to get carried away when you're a biohacker and you're, a, you know, like experimenting and you, you, you're fascinated and you read all this incredible research on each of these things and you're, I've got to have that, you know. Yeah, that's right. And that one, and that one. <laughs> and then you go broke in the process, um, uh, <laughs> which is a definite risk factor. But, you know, there is, uh, it is exciting times because all of these things are, you know, we are, we are understanding them more and and um, things that have derived from food food I like so you know our food supply isn't what it used to be our chickens are fed you know soy and they you know unless you're in New Zealand you got grass fed beef but if you're overseas maybe not and you're not getting your omega threes that way and you you know there's a there's a whole lot of problems with our food chain so I do think that we need to be supplementing, can I, you know. Can I throw something out just really quick? Is yeah. um, if I could, one thing about food, if I could, I don't want to say plead people, but uh, to, you know, the, the beg people not to, to do whatever, but I'll just kind of throw it out as a blanket thing is stay away from farmed fish. Right. <laughs> That's a very good a point. A lot of good things, of, you know. Yes, you're getting protein, and yes, you're going to get some of this and some of that. But uh, honestly, if you got That's a choice, good advice. And some people don't have a choice. I mean, no, our supermarkets people. don't have like salmon, which I love, right? I want salmon. We can only get farm salmon unless we get the the tin salmon. What's your take on the tin stuff? Yeah. So if you can, if you have a choice between fresh, um, you know, uh, fresh caught Pacific Northwest or Pacific salmon versus farm salmon. Uh, yeah, if you have a choice and you can afford it, because it becomes a price thing as well. Um, definitely stay away from farm fish if you can. And if it's a choice between farm fish and no fish, then farm fish is great. <laughs> But they have antibiotics and they have bad food practices and things like that. So we're not getting the omega threes like we think we're getting when we have a farmed fish. Or, um, well, you're getting the protein because it's meat. Um, you're getting way too. You're getting a lot more fat. You're not getting the the astaxanthin. If you just pick on salmon for a half a second, right? And at least here in the United States. Farm fish and um, fresh caught fish, uh, salmon, sitting next to each other in the at the butcher, and it's just a world of difference. The 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 um, I just blanked not coho, but the um, just blanked on the type of salmon. I just yeah, uh, one of the one in between. Yeah, um, just totally blanked on it anyway. <laughs> It's a beautiful, nice pink color. Which is the astaxanthin. Yeah. Which is the astaxanthin. Then you look at the farm fish and it's got big white marbling through and that's yep. fat. And it's not nearly as pink, but if you actually read the... the, the they put astaxanthin the, uh, little, in, little, don't little they? Bit. No. They were adding pink dye. They're actually, oh. actually adding red. They're actually adding red dye to try to make it look like it's pink. Oh, I thought so, they put put astaxanthin back in. Or no, but... they're not putting astaxanthin. They're they're putting that would red be too dye good. Oh. to make it look like it's good. Okay. So that that's how bad it can be. Right. Um, so we need to. Yeah. So tilapia from China would be the thing I'd avoid more than anything. Tilapia. Tilapia, is it called? Tilapia. Yeah. Farm raised tilapia, particularly from China, is going to oh. have all kinds of bad things in it. All right. Everything okay. The, That's super good advice. Everything from the, the plastics to the, the antibiotics to whatever. Yeah. And unfortunately, fish in general out of the sea, mercury and things like that. What's your take on, uh, you know, like smaller fish, sardines, well, smaller mackerel? Smaller fish are certainly more preferable. Um, 
And that's why I say a fish oil supplement is a supplement. It's not a replacement. But uh, a very good friend of mine did a, a, a very detailed analysis and looking at the IQ points. And the IQ points that we lose by eating a big amount of fish or the IQ points of a mother and their offspring is measured like maybe a half an IQ point because of the potential of risk of heavy metals. But the loss of IQ points by not eating fish is measured by like five to 10 points of IQ or not gained by mm. not eating fish. So gotcha. we only look at the one, we only tend to look at the bad side, right? You know, what's, what's it doing, but the heavy metals doing to us? But we're not looking at the potential loss of not With having that nutrition. Any yeah, yeah. And, and you can do things like um, I I tend to take like chlorella with mm -hmm. fish, so that if there is mercury in that fish, hopefully, I'm sucking up a bit of that mercury with the chlorella, which apparently can help with you know detoxing that, and certainly has its own good value in itself. Uh, so no harm, no foul, right? But it could help with getting rid of some of that um, mercury or other binders too that you can you can work on because we definitely don't want mercury in there. Um, yeah, oh, oh that, that's, that's super good advice. Um, look, Dr. Lewis, you've been absolutely amazing. I, I'm so grateful for having this time with you at your, you know, busy schedule. Um, and I hope I can stay connected and, um, I would love to get you to come and talk. I've, I've just started up a, uh, a, a group of doctors and allied health professionals down in New Zealand, uh, uh, to start to study and learn from people like yourself. And I'd love to maybe have you come and present on there at some point, just to share, <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. trying to educate, uh, from the no, side out. I... Yeah. I, I'd prefer to do it in person, but <laughs> well, that would be even better, fun. wouldn't it? Well, that's how, <laughs> that's my long term goal is to have a big conference down here, but I've got to take one step at a time, and then definitely I'd love to have you on the speaker list. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> it's a beautiful country; it's worth coming and have a visit. So, um, but you've been thank you so much for the the hard work you do, and I know it's a grind to try to get this information out there. Uh, but it is having a massive impact. You've written the brain, uh, the book, the when brain when brains collide. Uh, can you and, and tell us where can people get more education from you? Sign up to any newsletters or anything that you do. Um, help you get the word out there. Um, yeah, all of that good stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit in the process of cha changing things. I'm I'm not a particularly good, terrible at marketing. <laughs> um, we're all learning now, that you, one yeah you can you can get the book when brains collide through amazon um all around the world uh certainly and yeah i, I like highly recommend when, it i loved it you go to when brains collide.com but right now some hacker has messed up the whole website so i can't figure out how to how just to go to amazon that. that's where i got it i know so just go to amazon get when brains collide you can get anywhere in the world um, and so when I retired from the military, I started a small nonprofit called Brain Health Education and Research Institute. And, uh, the website for that is brainhealtheducation.org. We'll and, and I will make a, just an outrageous plug for this new product that I have come across. Uh, yeah, go for it. Zinzino, Zinzino, Z i n z i n o, Zinzino dot com, and if you go in there, don't, I really would say that they've got the two things I highly recommend to anybody is what's called the balance test. It's a bigger stick you do at home. Put put it in, you know, put it on into the post in the mail, uh, a couple, you know, two weeks or so, you get, you know, the results back by email. Um, so balance test before and down the line, and then their balance oil is the combination of fish oil and olive oil. 
And if you go into order or anything, um, you know, and ask you for this distributor, if you look, look me up, um, you know, uh, by name, you should be able to find it. Uh, or if you put out my email, yeah, however what you do you mean like? People, let people... But the other thing is you and I can talk about this after, after, after this. Yeah, now, let's do that. So that. You can have a little bit more direct access. That sounds absolutely marvellous. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lewis, for your time today. It's very, you, you're making a massive impact in the world. So please keep up the good, amazing work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an it's a uphill battle, uh, swimming upstream for sure. But uh, let's keep doing it. Just like those salmon. That's right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs>